Navy medicine really has been involved to, uh, to a great extent. Um, you know, our primary job is force health protection for both Navy and Marine Corps. First and foremost, our job is to provide guidance. And so we work very closely with the line, line both Navy and Marine, to, to produce best evidence, scientific guidance, so that we can continue to operate and do our jobs in the field. Uh, so we work very closely with uh, uh, OPNAV, with, uh, with the uh, operations office at OPNAV, and with uh, the medical officer of the Marine Corps uh, to coordinate and, and develop that uh, guidance. And that's been a very iterative process. And toward that end, I think one of the most important things to understand is, I think everybody's aware that, that our knowledge of this virus is very dynamic. And it was very apparent to me, and so early on I put together a scientific panel. So I put together a group of, of our best and brightest uh, regarding virology, infectious disease, preventive medicine, public health, a number of experts, uh, and they advised me and so that I could provide best medical advice. Um, and then that coalesced to become a weekly scientific report. So wanted to get ahead of the, the information power curve uh, and make sure that our leaders had really the absolute most recent evidence. With regard to how Navy medicine has responded uh, to the preparedness plan, initially it was, it was very reactive, uh, understanding the virus, understanding how to prepare to operate, uh, you know, to continue to do our job in, in the, the national defense, both for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Uh, and then I really moved into a testing phase, really trying to, to isolate uh, the virus, understand the extent of the virus, and, and really help us prepare our defenses. And then uh, really the third phase has been, fortunately, the, vac the development of a vaccine. Um, but I would say that, that, you know, in that defense, really the, the understanding of the importance of, of what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, masking, social distancing, hand washing, because those are really the bedrock or the foundation, the basic blocking and tackling of public health. And the, the vaccine now uh, is really, the, um, really the, the next step, the next tool that we have to really get ahead of the virus. Fortunately, within, within military medicine, we have not had very many active duty individuals become severely ill. But remember that our, our doctors practice at our medical treatment facilities and take care of beneficiaries and retirees. And so in that process, uh, our doctors have developed uh, in alliance uh, with the Uniformed Services University and the Defense Health Agency, really best practice. And so capturing what are known as practice management guidelines and really coalescing and understanding what seems to be working best. For example, uh, early on it was recognized that for patients on ventilators, that if they were placed prone, that seemed to improve their survival. I think you're also aware there have been very few medications that have been proven to be effective, but as those become available, sharing that information widely. But, but it's very important to understand that the treatment of any given patient is individual. And so using that toolkit and, those, and that practice management guideline uh, to be able to adjust that and use the specific tools will benefit that patient. We want to make sure that in the rare event that an individual has, a, has an anaphylactic uh, reaction to the shot that we can treat them right away. Uh, and as I said, that's happened very rarely. But in terms of, uh, I think it's, uh, the, the experience is that folks will have generally mild symptoms after the, after the vaccine. Uh, arm will be sore. Uh, they will may have low-grade uh, fever, some chills, uh, some muscle aches, and that sort of thing. And those can all be managed at home, uh, just really with supportive care like medications, fluids, and rest. Um, in terms of uh, whether an individual uh, exceeds those sorts of, uh, you know, vaccination side effects, then it's really between them and their primary care doctor. So we, we don't actively reach out to each patient that's gotten the vaccine. Uh, but we do encourage them to, to reach out to their, their health care provider. Uh, I think it's important for everybody to recognize what a remarkable achievement the, the vaccines are. There is a perception that they were developed quickly, but in fact, the work that led to the rapid production of the mRNA vaccines has been in development well over a decade. 
And so, so it was a matter of taking the specific virus and, and using the genome, the, the sequence, the, the, the RNA sequence, uh, and producing the, you know, putting a segment of that into this uh, structure that had been developed over about a decade. Uh, and it really is remarkable. Uh, and, and as we face variants, uh, that same process can be uh, used to adjust the vaccine. And so rather than think of them as, as you know, developed very quickly, in fact, it was really just the capstone of a process that's been, been going on for, for several years. Um, in terms of side effects, any vaccine generally will have low-grade side effects. Um, and that's, that's really a sign that your body is, is developing the defense against the virus. So, so in fact, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and then establishing that those antibodies, um, you know, the different vaccines have different ways of doing that, uh, but they are they are proven technologies. They're very safe, and their benefit far far outweighs any potential risk. So the the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are designed to be given in two two doses, and it's important that that uh, that those individ the individuals that get those vaccines follow through because you could end up with less than optimal effectiveness. And that is possible then that those individuals will be more susceptible both to getting the virus and to spreading the virus. The Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vir uh, vaccine is a one-time one dose. Um, but I, um, it's, again, very important that we follow, I'll follow through. The vaccines, uh, simply put, are biologic body armor. We would never send a Marine into combat without their flak and their Kevlar. And here we have an opportunity, a tool, a real defense against this virus. And so I really, I really ask people to think about, you know, taking advantage of this remarkable medical and technological achievement to protect themselves and also to protect their community. So to address your question, you know, is this a one-time one -time vaccine? Time will tell. Uh, there, it does appear that uh, as variants uh, develop, and in consistent with other coronaviruses, it's likely that it will remain endemic, that is, within our population. Uh, and so as boosters become available, I highly recommend that, that uh, if those are developed uh, and the CDC recommends that we get those, then we should follow that. There's emerging evidence that, that perhaps some of the variants are, you know, that the vaccines aren't quite as potent. But it's important to put this in context. Every year we get the flu vaccine. And success for the flu vaccine is generally believed to be effectiveness over 50%. What we're seeing so far is that the current vaccines against the variants are actually well above 50%. And more importantly, we're seeing that, uh, we're seeing that particularly for the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that even with the, the variant from South, uh, from South Africa, uh, that it actually prevents hospitalization and death. So there is tremendous value still to be taking those vaccines, even as the variants appear. Initially, the, 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 the biggest struggle with the vaccine was just having enough. Uh, and so uh, we're at the point now where as soon as vaccine is received, our teams are, are being able to get it into, into people's arms. And so, um, uh, you know, obviously as more vaccine comes online, we will ramp up uh, on, the, on the administration side to, to uh, keep up with the availability of the vaccine. The other biggest challenge, frankly, is what's known as vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and that's, uh, those are individuals that, that uh, have concerns about, about the vaccine, about its safety, about its effectiveness, about side effects, as we've already discussed. And I would encourage them, uh, there's an enormous amount of information available you can go to the CDC website. Uh, there's information on the BUMED website uh, that, that really speaks to the safety. And again, I would emphasize that, that generally when we get vaccines, we do have low-grade side effects. That's nothing new. Uh, and, and again, an, a, evidence that, that your body is reacting appropriately to the, to the vaccine and that you will develop antibodies. Uh, but also realize that the risk-benefit profile is far, far uh, toward the vaccine, getting the vaccine, given the significant detriment that we've seen with the virus. And I would speak particularly to younger people. 
because they haven't, they haven't seen their peers perhaps be hospitalized at the rate of older people. But in fact, uh, we are seeing that in, that in younger people, even with mild or asymptomatic cases, they can develop what's known as long, long COVID, and they can have symptoms, fairly limiting you know, symptoms such as shortness of breath, persistent headaches, muscle aches, those sorts of things, uh, persistent loss of taste and smell. Um, they, those, can, those can last for several months. So there is, there, we, know, we know what the profile is and the, and the safety is of the vaccine. There's still a lot to be learned about the long-term effects of the virus. And, I, and that's not a risk that I would be willing to take. And I strongly recommend that our, you know, uh, those that we take care of uh, avail themselves of the vaccine so that they can prevent that potential risk. There's no evidence to suggest that uh, just by virtue of the mechanism by which the mRNA vaccine works, there's no possibility that it would enter the nucleus where the DNA is and that it could, could you know, be included in or change someone's DNA. So absolutely categorically can say that's not the case. With regard to autism, that's, a, that's something that has long been out there in terms of vaccines. That was based on a very poorly prepared paper, which has since been retracted. Uh, and so there's really no evidence that vaccines uh, produce autism. And again, we know the tremendous benefit, it's a remarkable achievement that the vaccines offer generally 95% effectiveness uh, compared to now well over 500,000 deaths in the United States to this virus, not to mention those who who will have prolonged symptoms, as I mentioned. Um, so, so again, I would, I would encourage folks to, to go on the CDC website, uh, to speak to their trusted pr uh, healthcare provider, uh, and raise those concerns if they have them and have those addressed, uh, because there's tremendous benefit. This is a tremendous tool uh, that we have against the virus, uh, but for it to be effective, we need to have the by far the you know large majority of our population to get it. I think the process for getting an appointment varies by location, and so I would just ask them uh, to you know I think we're all we're all pretty good Google and web searchers at this point, and so I think wherever they happen to be, I would you know first and foremost if they're if they're military dependents, I'd I'd start with their MTF uh, and their and their primary care doctor and they should be able to get the information pretty quickly. So the, I mentioned the guidance part, and so we've, we've been producing what's known as standard operating guidance, and that's been adjusted uh, to keep up with our emerging knowledge of the virus. Uh, the other is to recognize the role that Navy Medicine has played by actually deploying and doing what's called defense support of civilian authority. Uh, early on, I think people are aware that we uh, deployed our hospital ships to New York and to Los Angeles. Uh, we also used our expeditionary medical facility, our field hospitals. We actually broke those into smaller units and those went to cities in the United States. From the lessons we learned from that, we were able to develop teams that FEMA, you know, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, where it was able to use to put together specific teams uh, that, uh, we could, that could go into civilian hospitals in underserved areas. And so we've had teams in Texas, we've had teams supporting the Navajo Nation in Arizona and New Mexico. And of course now, uh, like the other services, we're supporting the federal vaccine uh, effort. And we have teams in, uh, for the Navy, we have teams in, in Queens, New York and Jacksonville. And for the, for the Marine Corps, uh, which as Navy Medicine we support, uh, are also in Philadelphia and in, and in uh, Texas. I think our first response was to stop, pause, and understand everything we could about the, the virus's uh, behavior. And of course, uh, we were in the forefront uh, with, the, with the outbreak that occurred on the uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and and uh, the really, I think, dramatic thing there is, is how quickly um, we were able to adjust. And, and uh, you know, if you look at, um, we had an outbreak that, in, that included about over 1,200 sailors aboard Theodore Roosevelt a year ago. Uh, last month, we had a much smaller outbreak on the Theodore Roosevelt and ended up being three sailors. Uh, l using uh, the guidance uh, you know, that we've able to, been able to provide and, and everything those in the fleet have learned, we're able to stop that outbreak at three sailors. 
and and the, and the Theodore Roosevelt was able to continue its mission. So that rapid cycle learning, rapid cycle uh, feedback from the fleet, I think is has been uh, significant. And then most importantly, I want to recognize the incredible uh, resiliency uh, and discipline of our sailors and Marines, uh, because that that's been fundamental uh, to our ability to continue to operate, to continue to defend our nation, uh, and do that in the face of this unprecedented pandemic. Well, first of all, for the Marines and sailors who've gotten vaccinated, thank you. That's a fundamental, fundamental uh, step in our ability to return to normal, if you will. Uh, we've learned a lot. I think that they're going to be like any in any conflict. We learn as an organization. We learn as a nation, and I think that there are going to be actually tremendous dividends uh, in terms of our medical knowledge, of, Im of immunology, the ability, the body, ability of the body rather to defend itself, uh, in terms of understanding virus behavior, uh, in terms of uh, the ability to rapidly pr uh, produce a safe vaccine. Uh, and that's exciting uh, because there are many other diseases out there uh, and in you know, the world in which we live, what are known as emerging pathogen or emerging diseases are always a risk and our ability to respond to those quickly uh, based on everything we've learned uh, from COVID uh, will, I think, put us in a very good place. Uh, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. It's not a train. Uh, we are we are going to get a we are going to get past uh, this virus, uh, but it takes a sense of community. It takes a sense of uh, working together and continuing to do that. And so, for all who have leaned forward, both in the military and outside the military, you know, who have been disciplined and who have practiced the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the public health measures, who have lined up and gotten their vaccine, uh, and who look after their neighbors and their community members. Thank you.